хүний төлөө их хорн чин юу хийж чадах вэ гэж асуухаасаа өмнө та өөрөө их хорны хүн төлөө юу хийж чадах вэ гэж асуу ян зөвжөөрэй сан байцханы хүн төлөгчдээ өнөөдөр манай де факто нэг төрөлгийн зочноор европын холбооноос монгол улсад суугаа а дэлчин сайд дэд дэлчин сайд Mr. Push Arthurjwana. Good evening. Good evening, Mr. Jagasan. Thank you for coming to our program. It's a great pleasure for me. Mikhail Push. 1958 онд Германд төрсөн. Их нэр хоёр хүүхэд тийм. 1976 онд ахлах сургууль төгсөөд Германы армийн нэс хүчинд албахаасан. Bonn Parisийн их сургуульд суралцсан. Кембриджийн их сургуулийн олон улсын эрхчүүд магистр, Бонны их сургуулийн харьцуулсан эрхчүүд докторт зэрэгтэй төгссөн. Германы гадаад хэргийн яам өмнө Солонгос, Америкт нэгдсэн улс дэх Германы элчин сайдын яамд ажиллаж байсан. 1909 оноос хойш Европын холбооны Япон, өмнө Солонгос, Хятад, Монголын хэргийг хариуцсан элчин сайд төлөөлөгчөөр ажиллаж байсан. 2006 оноос хойш Бэжин хот дэх Европын комиссийн төлөөлөгчийн гадрын дэд даргаар ажиллаж байна. I understand you have another visit to Mongolia and it is uh, for this time very very for short time what you have done so far Well in fact it is my farewell visit uh, to Mongolia I've been covering Mongolia from Beijing yes. for the last four, four and a half years and um, my objective uh, was uh, to discuss where we stand in EU Mongolia relations where we want to move from here um and uh, basically prepare the ground for the new ambassador who has arrived in in Beijing and uh, um who will then take over the Mongolia file and uh, present his credentials here in March when he comes well before we go um i would like to ask you some question about you you have been a good you are a good friend to Mongolia in the your tenure we have done a lot of things about which we will talk tell us about your uh, I mean what it takes to be a European Union ambassador and uh, well uh, to be a deputy mission you have been in German army and then you have done uh, Cambridge school in the why you have decided to be a diplomat well that was something that interested me for um a long time um and as you quite rightly say um I've uh, worked and and studied in in a number of European countries um uh and uh working on foreign policy issues was something that I I always uh, thought would be a fascinating uh a profession um and uh, so I chose a a a study that would allow me to make that to move into that career um it would allow me also to study at different universities i was in bonn first and then in paris and cambridge and uh, from there on it was a natural move to apply for the uh, german foreign service um where i started my career and later on then moved to the european union you are representing a country in some of them you have studied but the country which is a uh, completely not formed as a, like united states of america right still being formed what it takes to be ambassador you obviously speak uh, german french english is it minimum requirement to speak those languages and uh, what is requirement mm. the um these are all working languages of the european union that's to say uh, in these three languages um people are required to operate uh, you don't have to speak all three of them but uh, uh, the uh, normal working language that we use most of the time would be english in asia french and some other parts of the world uh, and and all three languages in one way or another at our headquarter um what it takes um well uh, you need to have a a, a uh, finished um university study um you probably need to have some career experience before you join the european service um and you have to be a dedicated european you have been a, you are phd in comparative public law that's correct so does it mean that you have been comparing all these laws of member countries and what what is this now i i did a phd indeed on um, 
uh, financing of political parties. Um, that was wow, a, that's a, something what we that need was to a, learn. A hot topic in Germany at that time in the in the eighties, and uh, I combined my studies in Paris and in uh, in Cambridge, studying the system uh, in France and in in the UK, and trying to see whether we could learn in Germany a bit from different ways they were operating in those countries. Once a party in a political power. Is it financed from public money? Well, all political parties do receive public money. Uh, based on uh, what? Uh, based on the uh, outcome of the elections, based okay. on, on the um, votes that they receive and uh, based on uh, the, um, the fact that they are represented in the parliament. More votes, more money? Roughly speaking. All right. Um, then uh, does this money is reported publicly? That money is reported publicly. As well as expenses. As well as expenses, Spending. yes, yes. But, but then again, you, you also have the possibility to contribute and make contributions to uh, political parties. As a private is, individual. As a private individual. As do you report that as, too? Uh, you can. You From can. whom you are taking, as a political party, taking money for election. Do you report completely? Uh, yes, you do. I mean, if, if you want to deduct uh, your contributions to a political party from your taxes... As an individual person. As an individual no, what person, I mean yeah. is a political party mm -hmm. being financed by private money. Mm -hmm. Do they report about that financing from where the money is coming from? They do. They do. Uh, they, they, they also have to present uh, their the financial okay. sheets. Uh, a, a large company... Can a large company finance all competitors in a political election, like in Mongolia? Well, uh, any, any uh, company, for instance, can choose uh, whom they would like to support. And uh, some companies choose to support more than one political party, uh, and, and for various reasons. Uh, and there are good reasons to support the fact that there are uh, parties uh, in a democratic country um, that contribute to, to that process um, of, of uh, uh, political decision making. So that indeed is, is a possibility. Okay. Uh, during your tenure that you were for last almost four years covering Mongolia, I know I have been meeting, I had a, a pleasure to meet you every year when you were visiting the country for last four years. You have gone through several elections, including the one where five person have lost their life. Have you been particular observation, making observations about the election and the election financing in Mongolia? I have not about the election financing, I must say. Um, but I obviously, like many other people, have uh, felt that this was a very sad moment uh, 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 when these incidents happened uh, here in Mongolia. I recall them uh, at the time. Uh, I was not present in, in Ulaanbaatar then, but I got phone calls from the French ambassador, who was the local presidency, and we discussed the situation. Um, but what I also noted is that there was a, a, a clear support and a trust and confidence in the Mongolian democratic system. Uh, no one felt that um, uh, what was happening in Mongolia um, was similar to situations that we've seen in other countries uh, after elections, um, where there were disputes about the outcome of the elections. Kenya was a case at the, around the same period of time. And uh, I advised um, uh, my, my headquarter back in Brussels that they should not look at Mongolia in that context. That Mongolia was a democratic country that would continue that and uh, that this would not influence uh, the basis of the democracy and, uh, in Mongolia. After in the course of say after a course of several years, is it, it is is it still the case, right? As a I, democratic country. Absolutely, absolutely. Great. Uh, let's visit a bit the history of European Union and Mongolia. From which roughly it started, in which form was it, and then what's going on now? Well, we started really the relationship between uh, the EU and Mongolia. Uh, after, well, the liberation, if you want, or, or the, um, the freedom movement in Mongolia, early 1990s, from 1990 onward, we had a, a first uh, trade agreement in 1993. We did some TASIS programs, some support programs here. Um, 
And then uh, I think we had an, another uh, uh, upswing, uh, which started uh, during this decade. In uh, 2006, we opened uh, an office here, and that allowed us to have someone sur place in, in Ulaanbaatar, uh, um, and uh, sort of a, a foot uh, on the ground. Uh, we uh, enabled the European Bank of Reconstruction Development to cover Mongolia, and so they opened an office here as well. And from there on, I would say that every single year we made an interesting next move, an interesting next building stone in the relationship. Uh, in 2008, uh, uh, Mongolia joined ASEM and participated for the first time in the meeting of the ASEM leaders um, held Asia in Beijing. Asia-Europe meeting. Absolutely, Asia-Europe meeting, which brings together all the European leaders and uh, a larger group of Asian leaders. Um, and that, I think, was an important moment uh, for the relationship between, because it put Mongolia clearly in the framework of Europe-Asia relations. Because mm, at the how time, do you see mm -hmm. uh, with bigger Asian uh, picture, like China, mm -hmm. big economy, then Japan, then small Mongolia? How do you see Mongolia in that context? I mean, what does it, what kind of role does can, it can play? Mongolia can play a very interesting role. Um, and I was uh, mentioning ISM uh, because of a, a very important decision-making that had to take place. Did we look at Mongolia as a Central Asian country uh, in the sort of post-Soviet context, or did we look at Mongolia as part of Northeast Asia and look at this in the Asian context? And, and we decided to bring it fully into that fold of, of Asia policy uh, because we have a developed strategy on that. Um, now, what is the role that Mongolia can play in that as a small country between two giant countries uh, around it? Um, to a certain degree, um, it can work as a, as a symbol of what you can achieve in de uh, with democratization uh, in a country. There are few countries, in fact, uh, in this part of the world which fully made that change uh, from authoritarian or uh, dictatorship into a democratic country. Um, my first posting as a diplomat was in, in Seoul, in South Korea at the time, when Korea went through that process in the late 1980s, from an authoritarian regime into a democracy. And like Mongolia, they have seen a change uh, of the presidents and the, sort of the, the parties that were in power in a peaceful way. And that is a big step forward for any country. Um, and so I, we see that uh, in that context, um, uh, Mongolia plays a role uh, as, as a country that shows uh, this is doable, this is possible. Um, and um, uh, that is part of why we are so active in this country. The same meeting, uh, it was uh, our president went to Brussels mm -hmm. last year, October, I believe. Mm -hmm. And uh, next meeting will be in Asia. That's right. Uh, where? Oh, uh, I'm not entirely sure. I think it is in Vietnam, mm -hmm. if I'm not mistaken. Uh, okay. Do you expect uh, one day uh, Mongolia will host that meeting? Uh, that's possible. Uh, we do it every two years. Um, and um, uh, so, by all means, uh, mm -hmm. Mongolia has hosted international conferences before. Um, and uh, there's no reason to exclude Mongolia from hosting it in the future. Uh, let's talk about a uh, about little bit economic aspect of the cooperation. A uh, couple of years ago, three, four years ago, we have signed an uh, agreement called uh, GSP Plus, right? That's what correct. is this about? Well, in fact, the first GSP Plus um, it's um, a, a system of uh, general preferences for a country. Um, was given in 2005 and then it was renewed uh, and, and now it's up until the end of this year and can be renewed again. What it means basically is that um, for a, a group of country, a limited group of country, um, uh, we allow um, um, preferential treatment and uh, trade with the European Union. So it is uh, trade without duties to be paid. And basically, it means that our market is open without any duties for Mongolian Some plus products. Plus two thousand five hundred or so. Seven thousand two hundred products. Even seven thousand from yes. Mongolia can be. 
can be, theoretically. Yeah, yeah imported to European Union, That's the correct. member countries of European yeah. Union, yeah. without tax. Yeah. Otherwise, how much tax pay for? Well, that depends on the product. That Overall? Can, uh, that can vary from sort of 5% uh, to, say, 20%, depending it's on... customs the, tax or VAT tax? It's duties, duties, customs. Only duties. Customs, yeah. But you have VATs. We have VATs. Uh, VATs, of course, uh, would be added if a product is sold in, in, in Europe. Um, and that VAT uh, depends on the country concerned. Every member state... So if we bring right from Mongolia, say, Kashmir VATs. products, which we do now, mm -hmm. to several countries, mm -hmm. uh, they only pay VAT, not the custom tax. The customer pays, when he buys, he pays VAT. The yes. customer, yeah, the yeah. customer. Yeah. If you go to a shop, you buy, you know, and, and part of that purchase is a VAT, yeah. Uh, but uh, Mongolian products would be exempted from duties. When they, do you no particular goods which we which are a success story in that sense you mentioned it already kashmir kashmir, 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 um, kashmir products wool products i think these are um, two that that spring to mind um, and uh, i think mongolia has started to um, uh, to uh, have a brand name and reputation and, and uh, for for kashmir products uh, made in mongolia um, and uh, I think that is something that um, um, will be very attractive uh, as, yeah. a, as a product. Speaking and about brand Kashmir, uh, for example, um, say Zena or Chanel, mm -hmm. this, uh, these brands and other famous brands which sell Kashmir products, they say made in, say, Italy, but Italy has no goat. All Kashmiris come either from here or from China. At the level of raw materials, does it cover the customer's duty, not paid? What we talked about, does it cover the raw materials? It covers raw materials, but it also covered finished materials. Okay. And in fact, uh, one of the um, cooperation that we had with Mongolia is to encourage uh, the, um, the use of raw material here in, in Mongolia to have added value, to produce your own Kashmir goods and, and products, your pullover and, and, and other products made of uh, Kashmir. But not only Kashmir, also wool. Um, uh, we had a, GI, a, a program on geographical indications uh, mm -hmm. uh, that uh, would support creating a brand name um, for camel wool from Mongolia, for instance. How does it go? I think it, it, it works well. People recognize now that uh, a lot of good Mongolia. Kashmir products do come from Mongolia. Made in Mongolia becomes a, a bit of a brand name in that regard. Goat, camel and yak probably, other yeah. wood. Yeah. Mm. Do you think there are other promising areas in between two countries in terms of products from Mongolia? Well, I mean, one area where you, um, I'm sure, is a great, uh, a great deal of interest is in the whole sector of raw materials, uh, of rare earth in particular, um, where companies do realize um, that uh, we need more competition and more supplies. Um, and uh, uh, we see Mongolia as a very promising country in that regard. Uh, so that definitely um, uh, would be uh, an area of, of great interest for European companies. Certainly it's a matter of quality, meeting standards that uh, is uh, required in Europe. And speaking about standard, we had a wonderful contract last year. I think it is with the German ambassador, Czech ambassador was there. It was the issue of introducing European standard to Mongolia. Tell us about that. What is this? Which aspect of That's life right. it well, covers? Well, in, in, in fact, um, I was here last time in November when we met um, and uh, signed uh, a memorandum of understanding with the Mongolian government, uh, finance minister, uh, covering 50 million euros um, as our development uh, cooperation budget for the next three years. And that uh, fund is dedicated entirely to the issue of European norms and standards. And I talked uh, yesterday and today uh, with um, representatives of the Mongolian government uh, at the level of Deputy Prime Minister um, on what we want to do with that. We also had meetings uh, with various stakeholders uh, on the Mongolian side 
and I will hold a meeting with um, NGOs and civil society tomorrow to discuss what we do on development work in Mongolia and how we want to bring it forward. And just in a, in a nutshell, what we want to do with this fund is uh, we have a part of 7 million euros for vocational training and there we use European quality standards, European curriculums introduced to uh, Mongolia um, as an idea on, on how you uh, develop these curriculum and how you develop quality standards in education and vocational training in particular. 8 million euros for issues like good governance uh, and a range of topics that we can define. Oh, so this governance and vocational training, this money. Uh, well, in terms of our road, road maintenance, size of road, say size of a green structure per capita, etc. Isn't not those standards not covered with that? Well, some people uh, are interested in, in these sort of technical norms and, and or regulations and uh, uh, we, we are very open. Uh, um, I see. Because in effect there's a bit of demand driven. And uh, I could very well uh, see that part of that program that we are running under good governance in a broader sense uh, would also look at technical standards, including trade and DEAN norms and, 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 and uh, sort of regulations in that regard. But we could also look at uh, questions of sort of environmental regulations. Uh, is that adaptable to Mongolia? Um, I think part of the idea uh, from the Mongolian government to approach us on this question of European norms and standards, and I uh, met... Uh, so out of big spectrum of uh, European norms and standards, we, our cooperation agreement covers so far the vocational training mm -hmm. and governance. Yeah. yeah. Okay, on the vocational training, say the curriculum and the... Will, would there be uh, some certificate of... Uh, qualification of the graduates of that vocational training school or institute, whatever. Do you cover that part? Well, I think we have to define how we want to do it. But the, the underlying idea is that with the development of the mining industry, for instance, there will be a lot of possibilities and, and opportunities for Mongolians to work in that field or uh, in the service industry that will develop around it. So, as a country, you have an interest not to import those Certainly. experts, but develop them yourself. And that means that you have to have trained people, educated people sure. in vocational training. Um, and so, uh, Europe, I think, has a, a reputation of having Certainly. one Curriculum of the higher standards. Would teacher cut? Uh, we could look at that possibility. So, you are still in the process of finalizing those? Absolutely. The action list? Voilà. We, is, we are in this phase of identification. We go through two or three phases. We identify first what do we actually want to achieve with that fund. Okay, then okay. we fine-tune it and then we present it. Will the assume that they will, they, of course they will issue a certain certificate of certain qualification after training. My concern is a Mongolian who has that certification say working in excavat with excavator or somebody, something else, will this certificate be recognized in other countries? Will be at that level? Well, um, that is, uh, I would say, another step. The mutual recognition of um, uh, uh, certificates uh, of studies, etc., is something that has to be agreed between governments. So whether or not, say, the Korean government uh, uh, recognizes certificates uh, that uh, people uh, present and, and being done here is something that you will have to, to look at uh, with your school. In concerned. Chile, these vocational training standards, mm -hmm. curriculums, teaching, hours, are at the, such a level that after graduation they have received that certificate which is recognized internationally mm -hmm. as technician. Mm -hmm. or as a particular vocational uh, profession, right? So that's what I think as a result of everything what we do, I think Mongolians expect. Mm. Mm. Let's talk about governance. What standards do you talk about? Well, um, 
standards in that in that range uh, could cover a, quite a range of uh, different aspects. Mm -hmm. You could look at uh, how you set up a uh, civil service. You could look at the question of uh, decentralization and empowering of a local government and how do you do that best. Uh, you could look at uh, um, how you set up regulations in certain fields. You mentioned environment, for instance. Um, we could look at the uh, relationship between municipal uh, um, governing of municipalities uh, and um, central government. So those are these aspects. But there are also other ones. Um, um, we are looking at technical standards, um, uh, standards in the trade field that can all cover under that uh, broader sort of headline of um, good governance. Uh, what is something in this regard which is unusual in Mongolia? I mean, you have obviously worked with China as well. What is those particular aspects you think we have to pay more attention in order to have accepted European standard in public governance? I think um, what motivated the Mongolian government to specifically look at Europe in that regard and not uh, say the, the, the situation in some of its neighboring countries is that they felt uh, that the experience that of we have made in some Eastern European or Central European countries uh, after the change uh, in, in the early 1990s were somehow compatible to the situation in Mongolia. Uh, those countries had to go through a complete change and evolution of their system, economically, politically, within their societies. And these were challenges that were very similar to what Mongolia uh, has and is facing. And, and therefore, um, we believe that uh, you know, looking at the experience of some of our member states, uh, the Czech Republic, Hungary, Poland and others who have done that, uh, could provide some example, some blueprint if you wish. Of course, to Certainly. be adapted within the context of Mongolia, which is you know, unique in its own right. And, and therefore, the situation in Mongolia is different from the one in China. Yeah, this is unique. Uh, I think for those former socialist countries who became a member, member countries of the European Union, life was much easier because they have accepted just all standards anyway, public governance, technical stuff, everything. Here in Mongolia, we have a bit, as you said, different situation, mm -hmm. and which is, to me, a big hindrance. Mm. I say I would rather go and take it. It's easier, faster to take this law and regulations than change rather than creating our own one than uh, fit it into the standard that is working. What do you think? Well, uh, I think that uh, every country has to define what works best for it in its own context. Um, for the uh, Eastern European countries or, or Central European countries who went through that transition phase, um, this was a, a rather difficult period, transition period in some cases, uh, because it completely changed the way a government uh, or a country was governed and run and the way I its economy uh, was handled. Mongolia has now one advantage uh, in the sense that you already have a 20-year period uh, to which you adapted uh, step by step to some of these changes, um, and now you want to take it to the next to the next level. And uh, if we can help you in doing that, and uh, if if what we have done is of use in that regard, then all the better. And that's what we are offering. That's the part of your uh, consultation on development assistance strategy. Absolutely. Not only right. to Mongolia, but all around the world, right? Well, this, this one is specifically for Mongolia. Okay. And let me add one thing which I find is interesting in that regard. Um, this is not the only thing that we're doing. Uh, first of all, Mongolia is a special case for us. We increased our development uh, funds for Mongolia by 40% against sort of the austerity measures that you have in Europe. That is significant. And it's a sign of trust and confidence that we have with Mongolia and the good evolution of our projects that we had so far. But we will, we will do this in the context of other activities that we have here. We have 
currently running two programs, particularly in the rural sector, which are important for Mongolia. Um, we are uh, giving aid uh, after the Zut catastrophe in, in order to help that uh, preventive measures are put in place. Yes. And so we were the first helpful. one and uh, a very uh, important donor in that regard, right after the Zut. I yes. came here to present that. Yes, one of the first uh, fastest uh, reaction to what happened there. And, um, and we have now created a new uh, program and a budget for small and medium-sized companies. Because again, those are the companies that drive the economy, that create employment, and those will benefit from the chance and opportunities of, say, developing the mining sector here in Mongolia. Why do you have? Why have you called it uh, green pepper on development? Well, because uh, we think development has to be sustainable. Yes. Um, uh, if you just go for uh, growth. Uh, a la long, uh, in the long run, uh, this will not help because the, the bill will have to be paid by the next generation. I give you a clear example. Um, uh, East Germany was for a long time considered to be a very strong economy within that Eastern European context. But what we found out uh, after unification was that a lot of the economic growth was based on unsustainable use of resources. And uh, we had to clean the economy, uh, and that uh, with uh, considerable resources, uh, financial and human resources, that had to be put into this. I think a country like Mongolia needs to avoid that. So development has to be green development, and that's why probably call it green paper. And probably it's also printed on green paper, but well, uh, it's a green sounds, development. Sounds, that sounds good. Uh, I have a few, few questions, a couple mm -hmm. questions on human rights before we finish. Um, What's going on with this guy who is arrested, who is a Mongolian official arrested in London based on uh, the well-known case where a Mongolian citizen was uh, stolen by a Mongolian force uh, on your country, in your country, by the way, in Germany, and then it is arrested there. I mean, how do you see that? Well, in fact, uh, this is a case that uh, uh, you know, is being debated or discussed in, in the UK at this point in time. Um, I'm uh, not following this issue because this is the um, uh, in the competence of our member states. It's judicial affairs maintain is uh, competence, exclusive competence of our member states. Uh, so uh, I think this will take its course uh, where it is at the moment. Okay. Uh, this Bond Treaty, please tell us about you know, what's going on now. Well, Lisbon Treaty wants to do uh, what, uh, uh, what we have achieved of, for, on, for foreign policy, what we have achieved on the economic side already in Europe. That's to say, bring together uh, the Europeans on the foreign policy side. Uh, we are a, a very important actor and factor uh, in, economic, in shaping the economic situation globally, uh, biggest market, etc. But we have been sort of less uh, 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 successful perhaps uh, in unifying our foreign policy so far and that's what we want to do and therefore the Lisbon Treaty allows us to create a European Foreign Service and this European Foreign Service uh, headed by the High Representative Ashton, uh, Baroness Ashton has uh, started its business, its work uh, on the 1st of January this year and um, it is a unique a unique example that you bring together uh, diplomats from 27 member states and officials working in European institutions and the Commission and the Council Secretariat to form a new European Foreign Service and to represent Europe across and around the world. And uh, I, uh, I'm looking forward to be part of that in Brussels. Um, and uh, I, I believe that uh, it will put Europe on the map uh, not only economically but also politically. Well, uh, this is one of the missing step or one of the missing stones in the process of uh, future United States of Europe. Do I am I correct? Mm, Will I it think, be? I think. I think. Um, uh, again, the development of Europe is something very unique, um, and. Uh, 
I, I don't think we can compare it with any situation that exists. Um, you will always have two, um, two schools of thoughts. Uh, one is uh, uh, very um, community-oriented, uh, which believes that we have to grow closer and closer. Um, and the other one is one that is very conscious about the individual character uh, of the country and uh, uh, wants to bring it in into a context, but with certain limitations. And um, so far, what we have seen is that step by step, we were able to move forward in that context. And don't forget, we have to do it in a way that our people accept it. Uh, what is in your next uh, step in career? My step, next step is that I will go back to Brussels. I will join the European External Action Service. I will uh, work in a management position in the Asia department. And uh, I very much hope that I will continue to be in touch with Mongolia, a country that I learned to like a lot over the last four and a half years, where I have uh, uh, quite a number of good friends uh, here. And um, so I hope that I will have uh, future chances to, to come back and uh, follow up on what we discussed today. What are the chances of our development? We have a partnership and cooperation agreement initialed. We have to implement it. I think this gives us a whole range of new options in the relationship. Michael, you have been a big part and you provided great leadership in developing our relations with a big Europe, of a, with of a small Asian country with big Europe. And uh, I'm personally, uh, I think my audience will join me uh, thanking you for great service. And uh, we are so happy to have a big friend of Mongolia in that big country, in that particular department, working with Mongolia. I'm very pleased to hear that, um, and uh, I will uh, continue to uh, to uh, sort of try to advance what we have been doing. Um, it's been a great, great pleasure, and professionally a real challenge to do that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. When to the state, another European Halbani, when to the de facto ambassador, Mongol Dajidij Besin, Durunji Dajidasin, Michael Pushte. Osta Querda. I need to do a horn chin, you hitch at Hoyich as so has some. Ah, or we horn you hunted a new hitch at Hoyich as so. Young for July.